Welcome to our somewhat special. Our guest today is Neil Mishra, Managing Director, Cohen Asia Pacific Strategy and India Equity Strategist for Credit Suisse. Actually, no one understands economy and policy and markets and their confluence as well as Neelkant does. So thank you very much, Neelkant, for joining us. Have a great Samvats 2079 yourself. <clears throat> thank you, Dada. Thank you for those kind words. And, and we're very happy Diwali to you and your team as well. Thank you. Well, Neelkant, actually, you know, uh, I'm going to ask you a very uh, stale question, perhaps. Uh, you know, we know as market anchors, we should not say this time is different. We know as man market anchors, we should not say decoupling because it didn't happen last time. But it looks like that. Our macros are good. Our macros are fine. Uh, that's not the case uh, globally. Can you just parse whether we can continue to at least outperform outstandingly? No, I do think that our macros are uh, different. Uh, we are, uh, so there are two, two levels to that. The first is that the, that the recovery from the pandemic is uh, likely better than had been feared. And therefore, the pace at which the economy is operating right now is uh, better than had been expected even six months back. The, the second is that from a medium term perspective, there are several drivers uh, of growth which did not exist or were much weaker uh, in the previous cycles. Uh, so the most important being that the real estate inventory, the dwelling construction cycle is, I think, improving. I think the, uh, the, the Indian participation in goods supply chains globally, there is a market share gain. So, so in electronics, in chemicals, in maybe even in apparel, in, uh, in auto components. Now, the, the reason this matters is that even though the global goods supply chain is currently under a lot of stress, the, uh, the market share gains are helping offset some of the impact uh, even in the near term. And uh, then you have significant improvements in infrastructure, so uh, road freight is a lot easier to move now. Uh, and I think uh, these kind of structural shifts uh, matter a lot when you are thinking about the medium term growth. But I think this bigger picture, um, are, we, uh, are we going to be able to withstand a substantial global slowdown? is something that uh, we should not overdo in the sense that we will have an impact of uh, the global goods slowdown. We have already seen that. We will have an impact of the slowdown in, uh, in, in capital inflows. Uh, remember that we are still a current account deficit country. So if global capital flows are de-risking, there will be a growth impact on our economy. And also remember that our critical services sector has not yet started to slow down. Remember that US unemployment is still at only three and a half percent. And it is reasonable to assume that uh, unemployment there will go up and that will also be another headwind to the economy. So we need to close our balance of payments deficit. We also will be affected by the interest rates that we have been hiking for the last four or five months. Mm. And uh, so I think the economy will slow from here. Right. Okay. Uh, the point we make in a note published today is that it is slowing from a much higher level than had been feared and we should be able to hold on to a 7% growth rate. Okay. Well, I was coming to those questions as well, your numbers. But uh, before that, you know, we have not adequately parsed uh, the global environment, especially its uh, trend over the last couple of weeks. I mean, 4.6% on the US two-year. If the risk-free rate gives you 46 what is the implication for countries like India? So, uh, uh, in the near term, this means uh, obviously uh, very bad things, especially if you're a capital importer, that uh, the growth that you can sustain, uh, the level of growth that you can sustain then starts to slow down because you need capital to sustain that growth. And if your balance of payments goes into a very sharp deficit, there is uh, clearly a headwind to growth. Uh, but also remember that uh, the strength of the of the U.S. dollar, uh, not just because of the, the higher interest rates, is also a sign of de-risking, that uh, people are much more comfortable holding the dollar than any other yes. currency. 
and there is also i would say an, an a very uh, a very obvious short covering happening on the dollar remember if you if you borrow in a currency that you are you are short that currency so if several uh, trillion dollars of dollar based debt that exist on companies and individuals balance sheets if they panic and start uh, settling them and not rolling them over uh, it increases the demand for dollars so there is a cyclical element to this as well uh, which which uh, hopefully in the next 3 to 6 months as we get more clarity on how the global macro is is shaping up uh, will hopefully um, start to settle a bit as well Okay. Yeah, we are hoping that happens without uh, any accident. Uh, UK brought us to the brink of an accident. Uh, one hopes uh, policymakers uh, would have learned their lesson and won't let it happen again. But uh, let me come back to the uh, numbers you were mentioning that you know you expect GDP to come back to the seven percent mark. Uh, I did speak to a lot of economists. The RBI is standing at six and a half, and it is an outlier for FY twenty four. Uh, the next best number i have is morgan stanley at 6.2 and almost everyone else is a little sub 6 what gives you the confidence are you confident of 7 in as early as uh, fi24 no no i meant 7 after the slowdown Medium. we haven't slowed yet but in, in my in my um, assessment we our current growth rate is closer to 9 um, and and i think if we slow we'll slow from 9 to possibly 7 um, i'll tell you what is happening right um, in a for a forecaster uh, generally trend is your friend there is a lot of predictability in how individuals families uh, i would say businesses operate right so there is there is a force of habit there are uh, demographic shifts like people tend to have babies at a certain age they they tend to retire at a certain age so there is an element of predictability and when a trend breaks so when you see Uh, a trend line breaking the forecasters then get into uh, a lot of uncertainty there is a there is a challenge in uh, how far how how low uh, have are we versus the pre pandemic path and yes. also uh, what will be the trend growth after this disruption right okay. because these disruptions tend to disrupt the trend growth as well and now i think in september quarter uh we should be at a level where the base is not meaningfully distorted okay. uh june quarter was yes. june quarter last year was very very uh, terrifying very bad, yeah. but um, but but uh, september even on the the cso's numbers which on a quarterly basis are actually not very reliable in my view but on the cso's numbers uh, we were about 11% below the pre pandemic path back in september last year and that was more or less the level at which they uh, uh, talked about for june 22 as well okay. so september should be a, a a quarter where the base is not badly disrupted so when we looked at a very broad range of indicators you know uh, auto sales of various types uh, uh, rail freight uh, energy demand you know energy demand 3 year cagr is growing at 7% now uh, there is september 19 if you remember we had some cold disruptions even if you are just for that we are well above 4% cagr on on energy demand and that means the economy is doing well because energy efficiency uh, continues to improve so i think that the current growth rate is is very well higher you know consensus is at 2% cagr for mm -hmm. september quarter if you do a real measure you know and in the, the cso can keep publishing what they do but uh, in the markets people uh, will respond to what companies are doing and come and in you see uh, banks right they are they are not lending because they are reading the cso's forecast they are lending their senior management is letting their branch offices lend more because of the data they are seeing it's so, like neelkar uh, let me know, stop you there i take your point entirely that uh, you know there are problems with uh, the nso's numbers and this once i wish that you are right and not the consensus but uh, you know, i want to drag you back to samvat and to the markets how will it mean uh, you know earnings will pan out uh, the, the numbers i read for nifty eps is uh, something like uh, you know 870 815 820 thereabouts which is indicating more a 10 11% eps growth for fi23 what are your numbers and what would you look forward to in uh, fi24 in terms of corporate earnings whatever measure you want to use if i may say so i don't think fy23 matters other than uh, 
uh, for the market that is, uh, in, other than possibly setting a base for FY24. Because remember that when you are buying the market, or at least when I think about or advise people on whether to buy the market or not, uh, you are buying for uh, at least 12 months, right? You're not, I mean, uh, there are people who make money on day trading. I don't think uh, I have that skill. So um, I, I would rather look at if I buy Nifty at 17,000, uh, where will I be uh, on price to earnings one year out? And I think that the one year out price to earnings uh, is very likely to be uh, sub 17. So, uh, so as we think about 12 months forward earnings in uh, September, October next year, we'll have half a year of FY24, half a year of FY25. I know it looks looks really far out and and almost unforecastable. But you know what? That that is that is what will drive the okay. market. I mean, how FY24 and 25 earnings move, and I think that. The, the 12 month forward uh, as we are sitting in September, October next year will be upwards of 1000. And therefore, I think that, uh, and, and there is a fair degree of resilience there. So if, if you see the very early season, uh, early result season right now, but bank earnings are going up. Absolutely. And, and the incremental uh, EPS financials matter a lot. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, Neelkan, oh, since I'm running yeah. out of time and I want to get this question in, isn't it time sure. then to buy PSU banks? Isn't that, isn't, uh, would the alpha lie there? I, so I, I have some sympathy for that argument. We have had, we have been positive PSU banks uh, and overweight PSU banks for a while now. Uh, but I'm still apprehensive, and perhaps this is why sometimes age can be a deterrent, um, of going too down, uh, too far down the, the, the quality curve among PSU banks. Okay. So, so we have uh, a few PSU banks in our, uh, I mean, in the recommended list and uh, one in our model portfolio. So, uh, no, I think that uh, at least the good quality ones we should definitely consider. The ones uh, who are outside the say top two, three in terms of uh, return on assets and, and uh, past track record, I would still be a bit cautious on though, but I can see why some people would find them interesting. Okay. Thank you very much for those views. Uh, Neelkan, out of time, time is never enough when I'm speaking with you. And I do hope that this Samvat and the uh, subsequent Samvats are as bright as you are telling us it will be. We have to take a break and thereafter another market master joins us, Betty Subramaniam, the Chief Investment Officer at UTI AMC. Welcome back to our somewhat special Market Masters. I have now with me Vitti Subramanian, the Chief uh, Investment Officer at UTI Asset Management Company. Vitti, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Uh, season's greetings from all of us at CNBC TV 18 to you and yours. Uh, well, let me start with a heavy question. Uh, I did a somewhat with Indian, uh, you know, with economists. And uh, the general feeling is that uh, the GDP growth for FI24 is going to be south of 6%. I got an average of uh, 5.7, even if the RBI is standing at 6.5. So what is your earnings picture for this year and next? Sure. Uh, first of all, Lata, season's greetings to you and the entire CNBC TV18 family and all the viewers wishing all of you a very happy Diwali uh, and, you know, a wonderful year ahead. Uh, well, unfortunately, you started on the note <laughs> of cuts and, uh, yes, GDP growth estimates are getting revised downwards. Most of the estimates we are seeing for 24 are coming in lower than 6%. Um, if you look at the Bloomberg consensus earnings forecast, both for FI23, uh, which is the year ended March 23 and 24 as well, the trajectory has been one of a gentle decline uh, over the last two to three months. So we've now got FI23 consensus on Bloomberg at about 10 or 11 percent earnings growth and 24 at about, you know, 15, 16 percent earnings growth. But the trajectory is continuously coming lower. And, uh, you know, when we look at a lot of the global commentary, uh, what we are seeing is that, you know, uh, the probability of a recession in the U.S. certainly rising. Uh, we already know that Europe has literally a severe crisis brewing. Uh, China has its own problems. 
and therefore the whole global picture is looking slightly subdued. Now, funnily enough, global earnings growth and particularly US earnings growth haven't really been cut too much for 23. And given the rising probability of a recession or some sort of a setback in their economy, uh, you should start to see earnings cuts there. And I think some of that will translate into the Indian earnings numbers as well. So there is certainly some downdraft on earnings uh, forecasts at this point of time. Okay. Well, uh, be that as it may, this year we have been outperformers uh, as an index, Nifty, especially in rupee terms. So, uh, does that continue? Uh, I'm only me I only mean a relative outperformance of the Indian market simply because we are slightly less connected uh, to global growth. Uh, rival economies like uh, you know Co Korea and all, you know, logically should fall more if the U.S. is going to be uh, downgraded in its earnings. You're absolutely right, uh, right, Lata. We discussed this the last time we spoke as well. We have been outperforming. So there are two ways of looking at this. You could look at the last one year of the market return and say, you know, oh, we are down 4 or 5%. Or you could look at how all the other markets have done, which are down 20, 30%, and then realize how much better off you are in a relative sense. Obviously, as people have said, you can't eat a relative outperformance. You can only eat absolute uh, you know, performance. So yes, that is, uh, in a sense, perhaps slightly disappointing but yes there is significant outperformance uh, and I think it's important to just remember this right and you know uh, in fact I had some people call me after our last conversation and said you know are you talking about decoupling or are you talking about outperformance and we need to be very clear we're only talking outperformance you can't really decouple because you know 21 percent of your GDP is exports of goods and services that's going to be the area which will first get hit if global growth slows down but there will be second level effect on other sectors and third level effects, right? If IT salaries have gone up tremendously over the last one year, it's obviously created a bit of a spending boom uh, you know, in various areas, you know, you could argue that if the IT sector salaries start to cool off, it will show up at some level in the demand for real estate in Bangalore or cars in Bangalore. You know, I'm just simplifying the picture. So there will be first order impacts, there'll be second order impacts, and there will be downstream impacts. So we should expect that there will be some of that. Now, why are we outperforming? I think, again, it's interesting. You mentioned the word local currency. Now, you can be despondent about the Indian currency being down 7% percent for the year but when you look at a relative stacking of EMs we are actually doing very well right I mean in fact even China's currency is doing worse than us year to date at this point of time so you know we are as uh, Paul McCulley once famously said Today, India can claim to be the cleanest dirty shirt in the laundry. Everybody is in the laundry because your macro variables have been thrown out of gear over the last two to three years. But among those shirts which are in the laundry uh, and which need cleaning, yours is relatively cleaner. Uh, let me come to, uh, I mean, give you a half volley, as it were, uh, something up your alley. Interest rates. Now I can get 7.5% on the 10-year government of India bond. Yes, deposit rates have not risen, but that should follow, isn't it? Uh, in the US, again, the same thing. But two years is giving you 4.57. Why would you put your head into equities? Do you see a flows issue primarily for the domestic market, which you handle? Sure, we can look at this two, three ways, Lata. I think when you've got short-term yields in the US at, US at 4%, long-term yields, you know, above 4% as well, it's a magnet for capital to say, hey, if we can get this in risk-free bonds in the US, why go elsewhere? And I think there's also a deleveraging that's happening across the world, and that's contributing to dollar strength, because remember, that's the currency in which a lot of global borrowing happens. So when rates spike up like this, people may choose not to roll over their debt, unwind their positions, send capital back from where you borrow, it and that partly accounts for the strength of the dollar. Now, in India, it's very interesting. You know, when I talk to my fixed income team, we know that we can create portfolios in reasonably, you know, let's say a government PSU type portfolio with a three and a half year uh, sort of, you know, Macaulay duration, uh, which you could have portfolio yields in the range of, you know, 7.20, 7 7.5%. Um, and therefore, when we run any model to look at equity market valuation relative to bond valuation, actually, uh, increasingly, there is pressure uh, simply because the bond valuations are starting to look more favorable relating to equity at this point of time. 
However, when I talk to retail investors, they're not looking at the kind of portfolio that we can create at you know, 720, 750. They're looking at what they're getting on the one-year fixed deposit. And if you look at leading banks in India, the fixed deposit rates are you know, just a shade above 5%. Even if you go to a three-year deposit with most large Indian banks, they're at maybe 570, 580. Whereas in the bond market, you could actually create a you know, portfolio with a 7.5% yield today with reasonably good credit characteristics. So uh, to my mind, as of now, in our models, bonds are starting to look quite attractive. But I think in retail sentiment, they haven't seen it because the FD rates have not moved up. Liquidity is very tight. As you know, CD issuance has gone through the roof over the last one year. So what banks are doing, they are preferring to raise rates in the Whole certificate same. of deposit market rather than raise the FD rate. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And when you start to see the FD rates go up is when I think retail will also start having to ask that question that, you know, what's the attractiveness of uh, uh, that mm. FD rate to me? And I think once it goes north of 7, 7.5% on one year, three year range, that will start to create a little bit of pressure on money flows choosing to go over there. Time permitting, I will come back to this. Uh, you know, our viewers are going to beat me if I don't ask you sectors first. Uh, so, you know, uh, banks were such a favorite this year. Is it still going to be economy facing? What, what sectors would you... Uh, prefer now? Sure. So I think, Lata, long time back when we spoke a year ago, we spoke a lot about the auto sector where we said, look, everything that's gone wrong for them has gone wrong. Um, you know, they have a supply problem. They had a demand problem for three years. But how many sectors in India do you know where volume is significantly running below peak volumes of 2018? We've clearly seen a sharp V come through over there. We've seen the auto sector do well. Uh, we still think there is room to go on that, though the valuation comfort is not as high as it used to be a year ago. Uh, banks and particularly I would say, you know, uh, the consolidated set of maybe five to eight large lending institutions in India, that's an area we still like because we think, uh, you know, India's structural credit growth story still looks very strong and there's a significant degree of market share gains that these, you know, top six, seven institutions are making. So we still like that area as well. Um, and I'd say one area which is more sort of contrarian, bad news, ignored, uh, is the pharmaceutical and healthcare sector. Honestly, that was something we liked even a year ago. It hasn't done anything. But from a contrarian point of view, therefore, that's an area that uh, we still think looks reasonably attractive and, you know, we'd like to position over there uh, for the future. Thank you very much, Vitri, for not just giving us, uh, uh, you know, food for thought, but also ending it up with a little bit of medicine uh, for our portfolio in the coming year. Have a great year ahead. Thank you very much for joining us. And uh, all of you viewers, have a great Sambats 2079.